fall 2023 speech night. My name is Professor Ryan Guy, and for the last 10 years it has been my absolute pleasure to be the co-director of forensics here at Modesto Junior College. Tonight, folks, I think we have a fantastic show in store for you. The students at the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team spend countless hours and weekends honing and preparing their events so that they can go out and do what they do. And tonight, you're going to get an opportunity to check some of that out. Now, the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team is one of the oldest programs on campus. In fact, we got our start in spring of 1923, which basically means we've been running for a century as a program. Tonight, the students that you'll see on this stage are the next generation to carry that mantle and be in JC speech and debate competitors. They spend their weekends traveling to tournaments all across the state of California and even the country. Now, one of the interesting things and kind of fun facts about this is that many of the folks that you will see on this stage tonight actually got their start in speech and debate sitting in the same seats that you are. That's right, speech night is one of the main places that folks kind of discover speech and debate here at Modesto Junior College and start thinking to themselves like, hey, this might be something that I'm interested in doing. For me personally, speech and debate was a life-changing opportunity. Not only was it a chance to travel and see interesting places, but I made lifelong friends and acquaintances through speech and debate. So if this is something that you're interested in doing after the show, I encourage you to come and talk Talk to our students, they're pretty friendly, they usually don't, uh, don't bite, and they can tell you more about how to join us in the spring. Before we get started tonight, I just have a couple of quick announcements. First off, my guess is that many folks here are, are doing this as part of a communication studies course. You likely have an assignment that's maybe connected to speech night. My recommendation to you, if your instructor gave you directions on how to accomplish that assignment, follow the directions that your professor said. However, if you're not sure, we have a bunch of those critique sheets in front, which is a common way folks take care of that. There's information on the front side about the first half of the evening where you're going to get a chance to see some folks giving informative and impromptu speeches and prose interpretation. And then on the back side, there's a sheet for you to be able to evaluate the debate, which will be in the second, uh, second half. Most professors have to do both sides, so not a bad idea to just go ahead and fill out both. And hey, you want to do something else? You've got notes. All right, just the last couple of things and we'll get this started. I have some thank yous. First and foremost, can we just get a big round of applause to the MJC stage and debate team coming out of here? I'm literally could not do any of the things I do without their amazing skills and talent and work ethics. I also want to thank the professors of the Modesto Junior College Communication Studies Department. They're constantly looking for folks to join us and rooting out talent, and they've just been steadfast supporters of us over the years. Fine. Yeah, give it up professors. And last, I've got to give a big, uh, big shout out to the School of Arts, Performance, and Humanities. It is an awesome school to be in. Our dean and our support staff are great folks, and they always have our back, so we appreciate them as, uh, as well. All right. With that, I'm super excited to introduce my partner in crime to introduce the team to you. Give it up for Professor Tori Shem. Team 
Welcome everybody, how are we feeling tonight? Yeah. Well, this section is good. What about the rest? Yeah. Awesome. This first event you'll see tonight is an informative speech. This type of speech is meant to offer a well-rounded and objective explanation of the speaker's subject. The speaker you will hear from tonight is Tristan Seha. This is Tristan's second semester on the team. He recently took third place in informative speaking at our first tournament of the season. Please welcome Tristan with a big round of applause. In December 2016, two-year-old Gislaine Mbazwe arrived at the district hospital in Kabgayi, Rwanda, with a high fever and an acute malaria. We arrived too late. I thought she was dead. Gislaine's mother told Time Magazine in an article last Access in September 19, 2023. The nurses suggested a blood transfusion, one last hope to save Gislaine. The hospital had to request units of blood from the blood bank capital, a trip that normally took three hours. The lab technician placed the order and it arrived within six minutes. How's that possible? Well, the Rwanda government had recently partnered with a drone delivery company called Zipline. The revolutionary technology allows for the speedy transport of medical goods, saving time and ultimately saving lives. And it worked. Just Lane recovered. In fact, according to the previously cited Time Magazine article, she was the first person who owes her life to a drone delivery. Now, today I'm here to inform you on Zipline's innovative drone technology. We'll first discuss what the drones are, then we'll discuss how they work, and lastly, we'll discuss their implications. Now, most of you, when you think of a drone, you're thinking of a, maybe a camera drone or a toy, something that flies around your neighborhood, buzzing around, maybe annoying. Or in the worst case, you may think of a drone strike. Either way, Zipline is ushering us into a world of medical drones, drones that are used to save lives. An article published in the April 2022 edition of Nature Medicine explained that while companies like Amazon have used drones for consumer goods, Zipline is the first company to do so with critical medical supplies. The authors go on to explain that Zipline has already had a major impact in countries like Rwanda, Ghana, and Japan, and are poised to expand even further in 2024. The partnership between the Rwanda government and Zipline grew in the need for efficient transportation of critical resources, like units of blood. The application of drone technology here is a game changer. Zipline currently has two types of drones that they operate. They have the long-range country drones and the short-range city drones. The long-range country drones, dubbed the P1 Zip, have been particularly important in Rwanda. A 2022 article from The Guardian explains heavy rains can make roads treacherous and muddy in Rwanda, making the del de delivery drones a valuable alternative. A drone might reach a rural hospital in 20 minutes where it would take four hours by road. A, to a 2022 peer-reviewed article in The Lancet points out these turnaround time from request to delivery are impressive and out outperform many of those even in the United States. Zipline currently operates two distribution stations in Rwanda and eight in Ghana. And a 2021 article from The Verge describes the distribution stations as part drone airport and part medical warehouse. It's here that they house the fleet and launch the fleet of drones and store COVID vaccines, units of blood, medicine, and all more, all ready for takeoff. According to a 2021 report from the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction, Zipline serves over 3,200 health facilities in Ghana alone. So now that we understand what these drones are doing, let's dive a little bit into how they work, which we'll first have to talk about the launch process, and then we'll discuss how their drones are really unique. An article published in March 2023, peer-reviewed journal Vaccines, explains that the launch system consists of three important components, a distribution center, a drone launch facility, and a fleet of specialized fixed wing autonomous aircraft. Mark Rober, a former NASA engineer, explains this process in a 2023 YouTube video. First, an order from the doctor arrives at the distribution station. This starts the clock. The order is packed into a drone and placed in the launcher in as little as 90 seconds. The drones hit their top speed of 70 miles per hour almost immediately. Collectively, the fleet of drones travels 40 million miles and can run 24 hours a day. The previously cited article from The Guardian explains that hospital staff can track their deliveries from a computer or a tablet using GPS signals sent by the drone. Once it arrives at its destination, it deploys a small package with a parachute. Now, I'll introduce you to my good friend, the P1Zip. As you can clearly see, it's a small little package comes out with a parachute as it is launched to the healthcare provider. 
the, literally delivering it to the waiting health care provider or the patient. And according to the previously or the cited article from the Lancet, the drone then circles back to the launch facility where a specialized catch mechanism captures the drone by its tail hook so it can be reloaded and sent out again. So we'll send them out to make more deliveries. According to a June 2023 white paper from Zimply, their drones are designed to be autonomous and directly communicate with to avoid each other. Their programming also works with forecasting systems to reroute each other in the case of bad weather. Zipline goes on to explain that because they have fewer replacement parts and fewer materials, their simple design allows their low-cost drones to be mass-produced. They are electric, so they use efficient battery packs as a way to decarbonize delivery and reduce fossil fuel consumption. Finally, the drones come with redundancies and safety testing as part of their pre-operating lifespan. The previously cited article from The Guardian explains that the drone's onboard computer is able to detect technical problems and deploy a parachute, which allows the drone to safely land. The UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies describes these drones as obsessively engineered in a 2020 report. So, what are the potential impacts of this obsessive engineering? Well, let's take a look. There are really several implications to Zipline's technology. The first of which is it's literally a life-saving technology. Most recently, Zipline is looking at a partnership with Ukraine. A July 2022 statement issued by the Ukrainian Ministry of Health explains that they are hoping to build 10 drone hubs starting near the Kiev region where many medical supplies have been disrupted due to the military operations. Second, Zipline is ultimately more sustainable. This is true for energy use, packaging, and medical waste. Imagine the FedEx, Amazon, and UPS delivery trucks you see on the road every day. The bulk of consumer goods nowadays are transported by vehicles that are terrible for traffic, terrible for pollution, and the climate. Additionally, most traditional shipping relies on thick cardboard packaging and styrofoam or plastic cushioning. Zipline's drones are not only more energy efficient, but they also reduce packaging waste. The drones carry lightweight containers, not bulky cardboard, and the packages are also less likely to be damaged in flight than when they're stacked in delivery trucks. Most more, more importantly, drone delivery also reduces medical waste. Kenan Weyerbeck, one of Zipline's co-founders, told Forbes in a 2021 review or interview, I still remember visiting a warehouse in Tanzania where they have football fields and boxes outside, and we're wondering, what's the deal? Why do you have all these medical supplies? And they told us, oh, yeah, that's expired medicine. And that really hit home. If we could just provide a good solution for delivery, we can really have an impact. Now, finally, future developments. Zipline is expanding. In fact, as of late September, they were just granted FAA approval to operate in the United States. In addition to their long-range country zones, as we previously saw, they also operate a short-range city drone known as the P2Zip. A 2023 CNBC article explains this generation is capable of carrying up to 8 pounds of cargo and can land a package in a space as small as a doorstep or a table. In the previously cited video by Mark Rover, he points out that this could be by the time you finish a telehealth call, your prescription is already waiting for you on the porch. You heard that right. No more waiting at Walgreens. Lines. Now, Today, we've explored this revolutionary technology behind medical drone deliveries. We talked about how they work, what they do, and their future implications. It's not just Ghislaine and her family that can rest a little easier, but thousands more. In December of 2022, Rwanda announced an expansion that will allow Zipline to operate the entire country. They are on track to make 2 million deliveries of critical medical supplies by the end of 2029. And according to the May 2023 article from the Global Newswire, when it comes to this technology, the sky is literally the limit. Thank you. What a wonderful performance by Tristan Seha. I feel very well informed about drones. Can we give him another round, big round of applause? We let the rest of the audience in. Uh, show of hands, how many people are here for a class assignment? I figured. <laughs> this time last year, I was in URC. I had attended a speech and debate for my intro class, and now I'm here, so the sky's the limit. Who knows, maybe we'll be seeing you next semester. The next event is impromptu speaking. This is a limited preparation event. In this speech, the speaker is given a set of random prompts and has only two minutes to prepare a five-minute speech. Despite the time limit, the speaker is still expected to be organized and deliver the presentation with style. Tonight's impromptu speaker will be Sindel Hillis. 
This is Sindel's second semester also, and Sindel recently took bronze in this event at the National Fire Road High Tournament. Please join us in a round of applause for Sindel. seconds as One minute has elapsed. One minute and 30 seconds as well. to do it all, no matter what. 
Well, now that we're done applying our Rare Beauty blush, let's go ahead and dive into our TikTok. Now, Jimmy Darts is a famous TikToker. Some of you might know him from seeing him on your For You page. He usually goes out to people and he just blesses them with money for no particular reason. Now, people are like, why are you, why are you giving me this money? Why are you doing this? He's like, I, I don't know, I, I have it, I don't need it, I'm giving it to people. There was one circumstance where there was this young kid you see, and this young kid was about eight years old and he was homeless. Jimmy Darts went up to him and was like, what are you doing on the street? You're waiting for your mom? Like, what are you doing? He's like, no, I'm just trying to get some Burger King. I'm really hungry. Jimmy Darts then blessed him with $100 and got a fundraiser for him so that he could afford his own house with his family. He was able to live happily, and now that kid is always in his videos. As we can see, Jimmy Darts was always being kind to people, even if he didn't know them that well. Now that we're done scrolling through our phones, let's go ahead and turn the TV on. Oh, what's on the TV? Batman Begins. Now, honestly, in my opinion, this was the best Batman. Don't get mad at me. But it honestly follows a story about Bruce and him losing his parents, and he wants to get revenge in a way, but he doesn't want to kill. He wants to get stronger so that he can beat up people who decide to do this in the future. Now, Bruce was going through a lot, and since he lost his parents, he was living with his butler. This was really hard for him because as a kid, he doesn't know what to do. He just wants to live life. But later on, we find out that he's Batman, and he's saving the world. It's amazing. But he decides that when he interacts with the Joker, he doesn't want to kill the Joker. As much as he would love to, that's not in him, because someone once killed his parents, and it was hard for him. He doesn't want to take that away from anyone else. He just wants to be kind to everyone, no matter what they did to him. Today, we talked about Selena Gomez, Jimmy Darts, and Batman Begins. But let's talk about something that's way more important, Taylor Swift. <laughs> so, like I was saying, Taylor Swift is always kind to everyone, no matter what they do to her. At her concerts, she always brings someone on stage to interact with the audience and interact with her so that she can give them a chance. Give them their little five seconds of fame. She's always kind to everyone, no matter what, because one time she was in their position. The quotation I received today, no matter what happens in life, be good to people. Being good to people is a wonderful legacy to leave behind. Next, you'll hear his persuasive speech. This is a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem. The speaker uses emotion, logic, and credibility in an attempt to urge the audience to act on a controversial issue. Tonight, Eve Dowdell will present her persuasive speech. This is Eve's third semester on the team. Eve recently took first place with this speech at her first tournament of the season. Big round of applause for Eve. Torture. 
Yet the United States still knows it. And the international and our class access of 2003 describes the US as a world leader in the use of prolonged, indefinite, solitary confinement. It is long past time this changed. So today, we will unlock the problems, causes, and solutions to what Nelson Mandela was referred to as the most forbidding aspect of prison life. First, let's look at the problems with solitary confinement. According to a 2002 article by the According to a 2022 article, solitary confinement is a practice of isolating an individual from general prison population. This involves confining the individual in a six by nine foot cell for 23 hours a day for over two weeks. However, according to a journalist research 2022 article by Clark Merrifield, many inmates spend years in isolated cells. Furthermore, this practice is proportionally part of racial minorities, people with disabilities, senior citizens, and pregnant individuals, according to the 2022 Disability Rights California report. This practice has extreme physical, psychological, and emotional consequences. 2023 research by the National Library of Medicine shows that even just a few days of isolation can lead to physical and cognitive symptoms such as psychosis, hypertension, anxiety, suicidality, and self-harm. Additionally, through 19 research by the Peer Review Journal of the American Association, so that solitary confinement is associated with significantly higher rates in post-release morbidity and mortality, including a 78 percent increase in suicide. The U.S. Senator Joy Victor Thurman said, a 2022 report for the U.S. Senate Committee on Judiciary that the goal of prisons should be to rehabilitate offenders and prepare them for a successful re entry into society. If that's the goal, why are the federal and state prisons relying on a practice that destroys this possibility? To answer this question, we will move on to examine two main causes legal obligation and lack of enforcement. First, Prisons have a legal responsibility to protect inmates. In our last access to 2003, he easily explains that prisons have a legal duty to protect prisoners from assault from other prisoners. Because solitary confinement isolates the individual, prisons claim it reduces violence. However, the prisons inside the article that we just saw the center explains that the solitary treatment one receives in protective custody is almost indistinguishable from disciplinary custody. Furthermore, there is not enough evidence to support the claim that solitary reduces violence. According to a policy brief by the California Research Bureau of November 2003, prisons don't consistently track their use of solitary and whether it reduces violence at all. But as we've seen, there is substantial evidence of the substantial negative implications, including thousands of inmates that face physical verbal, and sexual abuse in solitary confinement. Next, lack of enforcement. Even when states like New York pass legislation prohibiting solitary, prisons effectively rewrite the law. According to an article by the New York Focus, the state of New York passed legislation prohibiting solitary for people with disabilities. However, the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision crafted its own definition of disability, prohibiting solitary for only select populations among the most severely disabled. The article explains that prisons in New York have sent hundreds of people solitary legally. Take the example of Lorraine, only diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The article explains that she's been reasonably well, taking medications to manage her diagnoses and earn time off the sentence in prison programs. But after defending herself in a fight, she was sent to solitary, where inmates are denied showers, phone calls, religious services, educational programs. What's this supposed to do? The rings are asked in the report. Someone who's bipolar, schizophrenic, sitting in a cell all day. They get suicidal. Of course, this worsens conditions 
for people in solitary? How could it not? Now we understand why this problem continues, what's up to submissions on federal, state, and individual level? The National Advocacy Group on Lock the Box keeps an updated tracker of legislation and to limit and ban the use of solitary confinement. Well, in the last access on September 24th, none of the thousand bills have been made to vote. In my home state of California, one promising bill was introduced. 8284 of the California Bill Act would make three major changes in regard to solitary confinement. First, it would completely ban its use on vulnerable populations, including people under 25 and over 59 years old, people with disabilities, and pregnant individuals. Second, it sets limits of confinement to no more than 15 consecutive days and no longer than 17 hours a day. This strict definition protects individuals from prolonged isolation. Finally, it requires prisoners to keep clear and current updates on their records, on their new solitary and physical being, in order to find the transparency. California Bill Act is an important start, but the past in the next few days, it is imperative that we push other states to adopt similar legislation, additionally, the President and Congress to adopt the same reforms. To that end, I have created a website with steps you can take to keep the pressure on. This includes scripts to contact your federal and state representatives. Reach out to them and let them know we must stop this inhumane practice. We can also take actions as individuals. The aforementioned advocacy group on Lock the Box is committed to building on laws like the Health and Health Act to ban solitary confinement. But they need help to do so. If you are as passionate about this topic as I am, consider donating time, resources, or even funds for your efforts. We have the power to be the final generation that allows this type of state sanctioned torture to persist. Only if we are willing to act. By examining the problems, causes, and solutions, we have seen that we must put an end to this inhumane use of solitary confinement. Since release in 2001, Robert King has served as an activist, a speaker, an author, dedicating what remains of his life to ensure others will not suffer for the key. It is time that we stand together and send the message that even in these solitary confinement, you're never truly alone. In this presentation, the speaker performs a piece of published literature. Performers seek to move the audiences and make their point by embodying the characters and inviting viewers to become invested and immersed in the act of storytelling. The performer you'll see tonight is Sindel Hillis. Sindel recently took third place in this performance at our term, first tournament of the season. Please welcome us, or please join us in welcoming back to the stage Sindel Hillis. I was working night shift and day shift 
I had no real prescribed breaks. I was learning to work with a 104 degree fever the day after my grandmother died, sneaking out between patients to vomit in the bathroom, only to come home and find out that my boyfriend of four years wasn't so sure about us anymore. And I still couldn't call it work because then I would be publicly shamed as being weak. And I was depressed because we were all depressed. But we didn't talk about it, because if you talked about it and your boss, or God forbid, your program director, thought that you were mentally or physically unfit to do this job, then you would lose this amazing opportunity that you had to save people. This amazing opportunity that was killing you. And what would be worse than losing that? Many healthcare providers are driven by a deep conviction in the value of helping others. However, after years of health emergencies, including COVID-19 and an opioid epidemic, we are facing what James Taylor and in healthcare described in 2022 as another looming health crisis, physician shortage. Of course, the shortage is complicated, but one main factor includes a rising number of burnout rates. Health leaders media in 2021 reported that post-pandemic, burnout rates ranged from 40% to 70%. A 2023 report from the National Institute of Health adds that ongoing pressure on continuous learning long working hours, excessive bureaucracy, organizational issues, poor communication among healthcare professionals, and personal issues, all contribute to burnout. In this prose, we will see how one physician grapples with the demands of a job that tests her limits, what it's all about by best skill. So we all have coping mechanisms, right? <laughs> Casual sex, of course, but it wasn't like on TV, where everyone was Dr. McDreamy and Dr. McSteamy. No, here it was more like Dr. McSweaty and Dr. Mc... Anger management problem. So, I stayed away from that. <laughs> um, what I like to do was go home at the end of the day, run a bath, put my face in the water, and breathe through a straw. And I wondered, if it was true, which is what they say, that those last few seconds before you drown, you feel really euphoric and really good. So the lights were off, the water was body temperature. It almost felt like not having a body at all. And those were the only times during residency where I felt like being stripped of feeling wasn't like being numb. But I'm, I'm telling you all this so you understand how looking at this woman who was my age, who could have been any of my friends, so you understand how I just shoved a breathing tube down her throat with the same perfunctory efficiency I used to snake the chronically drug plug drain in my apartment. So her heart rate was still dropping, and her blood pressure was still dropping. But she looked pretty healthy. And usually what that means is an overdose. So we started looking through things, trying to get some clues, and one of the nurses found her driver's license in her back pocket and got onto our electronic medical records to find out some more information about her. And I started rummaging through her perks, trying to find any signs of drugs or any pill bottles, and that's when the nurse called out that we were totally wrong. She wasn't really healthy. She'd actually been coming to the hospital since she was about 13 for a really rare and really aggressive form of cancer. And over the last 11 years, she's had around 10 counts of chemo. And the note in her chart basically said that she was terminal. She refused any more treatment and she was just done. So I was about to close her purse when I noticed a piece of paper. So I pulled it out, and on it was a list. And it read, 12 o'clock, take my dog Misty to the dog park, and take three Xanax. 12.45, go to bite and get the bacon sandwich with extra cheese, and take six Oxycontin. One o'clock, go to Duncan Square Park, finish reading the last chapter of Girl of the Dragon Tattoo, Take six more Oxycontin and three more Xanax. And it was just a perfectly detailed list of schedule, really, of how she was going to die. And we'd just been shoving tubes in her and needles in her, and that, that was fine. But reading this, this is what really felt like the violation here. 
And I had to tell everyone, right? Because in an overdose, what you take tells you how to treat. And I knew how to treat her. No, but I had taken an oath. I had taken an oath, and the oath basically said do no harm. But, but in that moment, I didn't know what harm was. Do we save her and bring her back and possibly have her die of her disease? Or So I did what we always do in situations like this. I held it up. Look what I found! And they treated her. And they whisked her away to the ICU. And that's when the doctor in charge turned to me and she looked at me. This is why we go into emergency medicine. This is why we come to work every day. And I was like, wait, what? This is what we're killing ourselves for? And she just looked absolutely pacific. And I was so envious in that moment of her, of how easy she interpreted the situation and how happy she seemed. And then she told me I had to go see the guy in room 12 who was complaining of penile pain. And I hadn't even got a break. So I just had to go. That night, I went home exhausted and sick. And I ran a tub, I got into the water, and I didn't take my breathing straw with me. I turned off the lights, and I just thought how nice it was to not have to make decisions in that quiet dark. And how nice it would be to just dissolve into everything because I had another shift in six hours and I just couldn't face it. So I did it. I let all my breath out. And until my, my lungs started to burn and my body, despite myself, pushed up from the water and I was gasping.
California should ban the use of autonomous trucking. Starting with a bit of resolution analysis. According to Fremont contract carriers, California ranks second in truck driver employment in the United States with over 130,000 drivers, making up eight of every 1,000 jobs. The University of Michigan found that autonomous trucks could impact 94% of operator hours, potentially displacing 500,000 jobs across the, world, across the United States. Beyond job loss, autonomous trucking raises significant concerns about accountability, insurability, cybersecurity, and ethical dilemmas for Californians. Beyond this, while there is a demand for truckers, the true problem lies within the trucking industry, underserving truckers by not offering union jobs. According to NPR News, Yellow Trucking filed bankruptcy, causing a loss of over 30,000 union jobs. While they may find other jobs amidst the driver shortage, they're unlikely to be union jobs. Let's define some key terms. Autonomous trucking is defined by the Library of Congress as semi-trucks with trailers that will be controlled from other sources such as satellites and advanced GPS, and will not have a human driver. These trucks have sensing technology surrounding the vehicle that is supposed to allow them to drive on public roads while transporting goods and services across the state. Today's weighing mechanism will be human life. In today's debate, we should prioritize the intrinsic value, safety, and preservation of human life. Thus, I propose the plan that California should ban the use of autonomous trucking. And for solvency, I propose that we maintain, uphold, and implement Assembly Bill 316 that California legislator voted on on September 22nd to ban autonomous trucks in California over 10,000 pounds. Let's move on to my advantages. My first advantage is human safety, and I have two subsets for this advantage. The first is insurability and accountability. According to Rosin and Err, a law firm with focus in the trucking industry, there are massive problems surrounding the legality and insurability of autonomous trucks. Let me remind you, we are not talking about everyday vehicles. We are talking about a fully loaded 80,000 pound semi truck driving 60 miles an hour down the highway right next to you and your family without a human in control. People who are, there is currently a bill that is pending in Congress called the AV Start Act. This does not allow people who are badly injured while riding in self-driving vehicles or injured because of self-driving vehicles to sue the maker of technology or take part in a class action lawsuit. This means if a self-driving truck runs into someone, there is legally at this moment no one that victim can sue. If an autonomous semi-truck driver causes an accident, who is responsible? If an autonomous truck kills someone, who can be held accountable? Victims and their families might face complicated and extended legal battles with uncertain outcomes due to the absence of clear regulations governing autonomous vehicles. The ambiguity surrounding this liability can lead to justice being delayed or denied, adding to the suffering and trauma of accident victims and their families. Subset B, cybersecurity. According to Negretti's law firm, when semi-trucks rely on computers to function, they are susceptible to cyber threats. If the autonomous trucking system becomes compromised, so would California's ability to provide food and basic resources to the masses. These are not hypothetical scenarios. It's not a question of if this technology fails. It's an inquiry into when this technology fails or becomes hacked then be held accountable? And how do we protect the victims of these autonomous semi-trucks? Illinois Senator Mike Boss said it best, we can't guarantee what hackers might be able to get into, and we can't put autonomous trucks at risk for our people. According to HTM Law Firm, autonomous trucks can be hacked in several ways, including remote access via the internet, remote access via the Bluetooth, inserting a back door into the truck, planting a device into the vehicle, or even putting stickers on signs outside of the vehicle to prevent them from being recognized by the truck. 
In 2019, according to uh, Hacker, HackerNet.com, a Tesla Model 3 was purposefully hacked on purpose to demonstrate the vulnerability of this software. It is hackable, it is possible, it has been done. Thanks. <laughs> can you imagine the damage an autonomous truck can do in the hands of a terrorist hacker? The risk to human life is too great. We must ban autonomous trucking. Advantage two, the moral machine dilemma. According to Valiant Mott, an attorney serving victims of automobile accidents, one serious shortfall of automated trucks is their inability to choose between two unfavorable outcomes. For example, what if a vehicle experiencing sudden brake failure now is faced with only two options, veer left and strike a child who has suddenly ran into the street, or veer right and crash the vehicle into the concrete barrier, killing those inside? Which decision would the vehicle need to be programmed to decide and who gets to live and who gets to die? MIT has developed a moral machine which is examining this exact scenario and comparing a large quantity of human choices when faced with this decision. Scientists are finding that the data collected shows large differences amongst different people groups. The vast differences in human moral decision making suggest there might never be a one-size-fits-all solution for programming ethical responses in autonomous vehicles. Manufacturers and developers will face challenges in deciding whose moral values to prioritize and potentially find themselves facing legal battles over the program decisions made by autonomous vehicles. Never in the history of humanity have we allowed a machine to autonomously decide who should live and who should die in a fraction of a second outside real-time supervision. <laughs> the risks to human life are profound. For this reason, I strongly urge vote in the affirmative and autonomous trucking. decided to veto Assembly Bill 316. However, lucky for you, we're not here to argue the competence of Gavin Newsom. The affirmative, <laughs> the affirmative strongly believes that the Assembly Bill that was vetoed by Gavin Newsom is what actually should be um, proposed and is the solvency for this plan. Cool, cool. All right, and so you're describing a human or a no-win situation. In that case, what would a human do? Um, for the no-win situation you're talking about, the moral... I'm talking about the moral. Yes, okay. So, in this case, we can see that an autonomous vehicle has to be programmed either one or two ways, that's it. It is very black and white. An autonomous vehicle is not able to critically think. They're not able to look around and examine the environment. It's black or white. A human has the ability to critically think. A human has the ability to make choices based on extenuating circumstances. And we simply don't see that safety or efficacy in autonomous vehicles. So uh, on, your, on your security concerns, you described how a Model 3, well, our Tesla Model 3, was uh, hacked. Do you know the reasoning why and how they did that? So they specifically hacked it with the intent of demonstrating the vulnerabilities of this software. It was a bunch of hackers that came together and decided they were going to hack it and see what they could get the vehicle to do, simply to demonstrate the ability that it is possible. Gotcha. And then did they have access to the driving systems through that hacking? Yeah, my understanding is they didn't. They did it in the same way that a regular hacker would have. And speaking to that, did they do that over the air or did they do that in person? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not a technical expert, but my, my um, evidence states that in 2019 that Tesla Model 3 was hacked on purpose to demonstrate the vulnerabilities of the software. Gotcha. And that will mm -hmm. be my questioning. Thank you. I now recognize the debater from the negative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed six minutes. All right. 
just to get some easy things out of the way first of what I'm going to do here. I'm first going to go over some top of case, meaning what my opponent has defined the terms of this debate, and then I'll go into some of their advantages of this plan, and I will go over my own disadvantages as well. All right, so starting with some simple top of case, I won't disagree with anything that my opponent has defined as. All the definitions seem pretty understandable and contextual in this debate and leave equal grounds for both the affirmative and the negative. So I will not disagree with any of those definitions. My opponent has described the way mechanism being the human life angle, which I will understandably agree that we should be valuing human lives here. So I'll describe to you what human lives we should really be thinking about in my own speech. Now, my opponent goes over some of their uh, advantages to this plan. Ultimately, that there are disadvantages when it comes to anonymous trucking, or autonomous trucking, being that of the moral dilemmas or whether or not you would be able to take accountability for trucking. Now, my opponent comes up here and argues that accountability doesn't work, that being able to have an autonomous truck means that there's no one driving, no one held accountable, that the people that are held, or they came up here with a source saying that there is no one to take accountability, that you can't sue the maker of the technology. Well, yes, you can't sue the maker of the technology, the people that operate the truck are still held accountable. You may not be able to sell, well, the technology company that made the AI, or the autonomous trucking software, or even the sensors. But you still can sue the company that operates them. In most cases nowadays, if a truck causes, causes an incident with a normal truck driver, the truck company still takes accountability. The truck driver and the company both have to take accountability. But most of it falls on the company. The insurance that is paid for by the company is what takes accountability. So if the company is still being held accountable. This isn't just simply saying that no one's going to take accountability. We have a truck that is being operated by no one, that aligns with no one, and is being operated by no one. It is a company that owns the truck. They are operating the truck. They know what they're doing with their truck. So they have to have safety places in measure. My opponent then goes into some of the ideas of cybersecurity, that the reliance is then susceptible to cyber threats. However, my opponent brings up an example of the Tesla Model 3 that was hacked, and they said it was purposeful. Now, I'll give you a little key and interesting details that my opponent has left out. The reason that they did this was to, uh, or the reason they did this was a competition. They wanted to see if they could get through the, uh, the security systems that were put in place to see if they could get through, and they did. I'll admit that. They did get through. But here's the thing that they didn't get through. Like I described, they didn't get through the driving systems, one of the main areas of safety concern. My opponent came up here and described that they were able to remote access the entertainment, the Bluetooth systems. Oh no, they put on Taylor Swift. <laughs> Deary me, it's terrible. The way that these systems are built are made to be separate. They are meant to be separate so that way they don't cause concerns such as the ones my opponent are going to come up here and try and argue exist. Now, moving into my disadvantages is the first of which is going to be autonomous trucking boosts our economy. Now, existing driver shortage in the long haul sector is tremendous. According to, according to Mark Place and to Orange County, 78,000 truck driver shortage with a possibility of reaching 160,000 by 2030. My opponent came up here and described that we have a lot of truck drivers in California without addressing how many we are short. We have 78,000 currently short. 160,000 by 2031. That's a problem. Now, according to the Orange County Register, there are massive applications of autonomous trucking, especially when it comes to jobs such as trucking and being able to work hand in hand with the trucking and shipping workforce to boost California's supply chain. And we ultimately have issues when it comes to the long haul sector. We are running out of people that want to do these jobs, which moves into my second disadvantage, but we'll get to that in a minute. One said confirmed that autonomous long haul trucks would increase the economic output of the Golden State by $6.5 billion and add around 2,400 jobs, meaning no mass layoffs. My opponent will say that we are going to be getting rid of people's jobs by putting in autonomous trucking but it's meant to go hand in hand. There are supposed to be ways for us to both make up and mitigate the issue, but still allow the drivers to keep their jobs, and also be able to make new jobs for people that want to go into the trucking industry, but don't want to actually drive for long hours. Which moves me to my second disadvantage, the pure lack of interest. Now, there are generations that are simply not interested in doing a job that takes long hours anymore. There are different values that are being upheld by new generations that simply don't align with them. And due to the working conditions, the low pay, and the lack of benefits. The new generations don't want to do trucking. They don't want to be truckers. 
it's long hours, hours away from your family, lack of benefits, lower pay, all of these things people don't want to do. They don't want to deal with it, so they simply don't go into the industry. According to the American Journal of Transportation, there is a high demand for truck drivers in the U.S. as almost all businesses need them, and yet there are too few truckers available. The workforce of truckers is one that is plagued with retirement, as there is roughly five times as many older drivers aged 55 years and above as younger drivers. Again, causing problems. We have a workforce that is slowly but surely running out, and more people that don't want to join it. Many drivers are leaving the industry in search of jobs that offer better pay, working conditions, and benefits. These truckers are not happy spending long hours behind the wheels, sleeping on the side of the road, or spending nights at a gas station. And we shouldn't be forcing that upon them. The impact here is just one of best interest to the industry and the people that work for it. They're, they no longer work, want to work in a sector where they feel forced to work. We, have, we can have a fleet of autonomous vehicles that are able to make up for the lack of truck drivers while also allowing those feeling dissatisfied with the hours to have some leeway for the ability for people to go home. That's what's important here. Our truck drivers are the ones we should be thinking about. They can ultimately make what our society is today. All of our consumer goods that we get, most are by trucking. And we are simply ignoring the fact that they do it almost out of the goodwill of their hearts. We can't ignore that. Now, my opponent has described some of the issues that I will address. According to TechCrunch.com, the researchers highlighted the abilities of Tesla, which is the company that my opponent described as the one that got hacked, as doing a great job to make the car hard to hack, implementing a mature system of sandboxes which isolates components and makes it easy, or harder to hack. Over-the-air systems are disconnected from this car's internal structure, meaning you cannot access the systems such as the drivetrain or other systems that are more important for the safety systems. They are separate and they are put into separate categories so that way this isn't a problem. Now, according to Manhattan Institute, 90% of collisions are a result of human error. AI represents an enormous opportunity for safety improvement. Early results with AI drivers in cities indicate that AVs are 50% less likely to be involved in collisions. 50%. And we're trying to come up here and say that they're not safe. That seems like an issue to me. Ultimately, in the negation here today, I have brought you the issues at hand. And I have brought you how these issues could be mitigated with autonomous trucking. We need to be thinking about our truck drivers that are out there working hours so that way you can get your Amazon deliveries on time. We need to be thinking about them as they make up what our society is, how we are able to function. Our truck drivers are important. They're very important. And being able to say that they should continue to feel forced to work in an industry that doesn't support them is wrong. So I stand here before you today and say we should have autonomous trucks and we should allow them to be on California roads. Thank you.
but contextually, I would assume that many people that are of, especially the older generations, they have families, they have brothers and sisters, they have parents, they have people that they want to see. They might have grandkids at this point. They all want to see their families, regardless of whether or not you can say that they have like significant others. They still have family beyond that.
few minutes, go over some of the rebuttals, and then I will be going into, well, reinforcing my own case and why you'll be voting for the mitigation in this debate today. So, starting off with some of their rebuttals and what they described. So they really put a focus on the human life, the preservation of human life, and saying that the economy has no influence. I would argue that it's directly correlated. If we have a good economy, we have cheaper food for our people, we have eight or more jobs, we have a better economy for the people's lives that live in the society we currently operate in. We need to have a good society in order to keep human life preserved, meaning that economy is directly related. It is not going to be thrown out of the space because the economy describes that it doesn't fall under the category of human life. Just because it doesn't have human in it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect human life. My opponent then describes that their line of interest just simply isn't true. They describe the uh, yellow trucking incident, which they describe that 30,000 people in California are looking for jobs. Well, I have a startling issue for you. That isn't in California. That is in Tennessee. We are talking about California here, of which Yellow Trucking operated in Tennessee, meaning those 30,000 union workers that are looking for jobs operate in a right-to-work state, meaning that they are able to have issues with the unions, meaning that companies don't have to hire them. So my opponent may say that there are 30,000 workers in California that are not having jobs because they were with a union. That is not in California, that is in Tennessee. Yellow Trucking was in Tennessee, and they are having issues finding jobs in Tennessee, not California, which are the major My opponent described that there are 130,000 drivers. That's, it's not a shortage. I brought up the entire stat of our shortage. We have 78,000 truck driver shortage here. 78,000 people short. That's a lot. It's going to get to 160,000 by 2031 if we can't mitigate this issue, which is ultimately what I'm here to describe today. We need to have a way to mitigate the issue. My opponent will say, well, we can have people that'll pay more. We can have companies pay them more. They're trying to pay them more. They're having an issue of people not wanting to join. That's why there is a 78,000 truck driver shortage. That number doesn't just come from nowhere. It comes from people not wanting to work. Whether or not you can see that as being people lack of interest or simply because they aren't paying enough. People don't want to work the hours. It's not that. My opponent then came up here and described yet again their, uh, their stat and their statistic describing the manufacturer that they can't sue the manufacturer. And then they added in the little and anyone involved as a way to try and quell the issue that I brought up, being that you can't or that you can't sue the manufacturer of the technology, but you still can sue the, uh, the company that owns the truck, which is still happening today. We still are able, if a truck driver gets into a collision, you can still sue the company that owns the truck. That is still not a problem, and it isn't going to be a problem. It's going to continue to exist. My opponent then added their little and anyone involved as a way to say, we aren't going to be able to sue the companies, but we are already able to sue the companies that own the trucks, meaning this issue is already called in the status quo. Let's see. All right. My opponent describes that the, they're harder to hack, but you can't get rid of the issue. Again, I described to you the issues that are hackable and over the air hackable, which means the ones where cyber, cyber terrorists are able to get into your car and play Taylor Swift. Uh, all of those issues are quelled because if we're thinking about safety here, again, I don't think Taylor Swift is a danger to any of you, hopefully, but in the case that it is, it's not a system that's going to cause harm to other people. The driving system is a completely separate issue. It's a completely separate subsection that isn't allowed to be within the areas of over the air internet access meaning it is a completely cut off system. It's not going to be used to hack, it can't be hacked, unless someone is inputting the driver system directly. <laughs> My opponent is coming up here and describing that autonomous AI cars and all of those assists are ultimately horrible, that we shouldn't allow them on the road. Well, they are allowed on the road. They're allowed in cars that we use every day. We still have cars that have lane assist, that are actively keeping track of your lane and keeping you in the lane. Those are safety features that use AI as a way to keep our cars safe. The same thing can be said about Tesla and the way that they use their AI. They are training to keep it better. They're trying to make it better. All of those things being used as a way to continue to improve our technology and keep it safe, which if we're dealing with human life here and the preservation of human life, safety is at the top concern of what AI and autonomous trucking is trying to do. And so, just to reinforce my case yet again, I'll go over my disadvantage, or my disadvantages. The first of which was, again, autonomous trucking moves the economy. It is directly related to the weighing mechanism of today's debate. 
It is directly related to the preservation of human life. We should be valuing the economy as we should value our economy every single day of our lives. We should be focusing on trying to make our economy better so that way we can improve the lives of every single person in the state. Then for my second disadvantage, again, the lack of interest. The lack of interest is real. That 78,000 that 78, shortage doesn't come from nothing. It doesn't come from people just saying, we're not going to give you the amount of money that you're asking for. That doesn't come from people saying, oh, that's not enough benefits. That's from people that simply don't want to work it. Again, people don't want to work and do trucking simply because it keeps them a, either away from their families or they just don't want to work the long hours. Either way, it's truck drivers that we should be focusing on. Truck drivers are the crux of what makes our society whole. They deliver our goods, they deliver our food. They are the crux of what our society is. We should care about what makes them better. We shouldn't be caring about whether or not our whole society can be operated on autonomous trucks. That's not what it's trying to do. It's trying to mitigate the issue that currently is presented in the status quo. There is 78,000 truck driver shortage with 160,000 on the way in 2031. That is an issue that needs to be mitigated. My opponent can try and say that it can be mitigated by improving benefits and improving pay, but that isn't working. So something else needs to be done. We should be supporting autonomous trucks as a way to help truck drivers see their families. Support truck drivers so that way they can have their own hours. They yeah. don't have to break their necks working every day. So that way we can support our truck drivers who support us every single day. So for those reasons, I strongly vote and urge, or urge you to vote for the negation in this debate. Thank you. ourselves and our families if an autonomous truck kills 
someone we love. There's literally a law in place eliminating your right. When it comes to cybersecurity, we can clearly see that this technology has already been hacked into, and my opponent is trying to tell you they're hacking into your radio. And I would tell you that Negretti's law firm and Senator Mike Boss would not be stating this, saying this was a concern if the only things these hackers had the ability to hack into was your radio. I'm sorry, but that is a ridiculous assumption. And I've already heard several times that there's multiple ways that you can hack into an autonomous truck, and it doesn't even have to be inside the vehicle. You can cover a stop sign and the truck wouldn't even be able to read that at the stop sign. That is the problem here. Moving on to my second advantage, the moral machine, my opponent completely unaddressed. Humans make so many different choices, we don't even know how to program an autonomous vehicle. We don't know if we should tell the vehicle to run over the child that ran into the street or kill the inside passengers because every single human would make a different choice. And unless we can quantify how humans would react, it does not seem worth the risk to program a vehicle to choose black or white. It's unsafe. Humans have the ability to think more critically, and the risk to human life is too great with autonomous trucking. For this reason, I urge both the affirmative. Thank you. One more big round of applause for Tristan and Joel. All right, folks. Debates have winners, and debates have losers. And tonight, we're going to give you the opportunity to vote. But we're going to do a little applause meter. If at the end of this debate, you think Tristan has convinced you on the negative that we ought not to uphold this resolution, let me hear you now. Kayla has convinced you on the affirmative that we should uphold the resolution. Woo!